Hello, everyone. I'm Frank Garza with Lean Startup Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today's topic is applying lean to marketing and brand strategy, and moderating the discussion is our own Lean Startup Company faculty member, Elliot Susel. Our guest is founder and chief brand strategist at SoHouse, Jessica Courthouse. And with that, I'll hand things off to Elliot. Hello, my friends, and welcome to this week's webcast. My name is Elliot Susel, senior faculty member with Lean Startup Company. And today we have this pleasure of speaking with Jessica Courthouse, who is the founder and chief brand strategist at SoHouse. Jessica, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to be here. So we're going to be talking about the intersection of lean startup and brand strategy and maybe some rebranding. I am seriously not a marketing or brand (laughs) specialist. In fact, I would say that I'm like really kind of a novice. Uh, And so I'm really eager to have this conversation. And, you know, some of my background is in growth. So I'll be eager to see some of the intersection there as well. To sort of put some structure to our conversation, I think what we do is we start by learning your background a little bit, specifically as it relates to founding a company, because you founded a company, which is awesome. And uh, from there, I'll be eager to dig into kind of the work that you're doing at the company you founded. Okay, awesome. Um, Well, it's actually my second company. So had a lot of learnings from my first one, good and bad. So Mm -hmm. that's that. Um, but yeah, I mean, my story is I've been working in the broader field of marketing communications for about a decade. Um, my first entryway into entrepreneurship was actually sort of forced. I was working at a large corporation and my job got eliminated. Mm. So, yeah. And I was like, mm-hmm. uh. <laughs> so I was kind of forced into entrepreneurship. I had never really been around entrepreneurs, never knew any entrepreneurs. It just was not a space that I understood. And then it wasn't until I actually decided to become an entrepreneur that I did some backtracking and I was like, oh, I'm not crazy. Like there, you know, like I just operate on a different planet and the way that I think about things is very different. And I mean, I always did well in the corporate jobs that I had, but I definitely felt that I would hit a ceiling. I would hit, I would hit the capacity of the box that I was in. Mm. I was never around entrepreneurs. I didn't, I didn't have that sort of comparison. So yeah, so at the time, my now husband, uh, but at the time he was my fiance, I came home, we had like seven bottles of wine, and I was so upset that I had lost my, my corporate dream job, and he wanted to do something a little bit different, so within that weekend, we built this super crappy website, and then poof, we started our first agency, and uh, we had that for about four and a half years, and it just grew really slowly, really organically, authentically. And we got to work with TED Women, Red Bull. Um, I got to work with Stanford University. I did some work with, who else? Girls Who Code. And it was awesome. It was a wild ride. So that was my first, my first company. Okay. Um, this is your first company. Now, did, at that point, were you familiar with Lean Startup? Were you using Lean Startup principles? Or were you just like winging it, making it up? Totally winging it. Yeah. Okay. Totally. I, I, yeah, it was just like this absolutely scrappy thing. And, you know, we had no clients and nothing. We just completely bootstrapped it from scratch. And then through that process, I got involved in the uh, local ecosystem where I live now, which is Orlando, Florida. I'm relocating to Atlanta next year. But, um, and that's when I learned about lean. That's where I started getting involved in entrepreneurship. And I started understanding the community that was around entrepreneurship. And I started Mm -hmm. doing um, startup weekend Orlando and some other things. So I, through that experience is how I got into it. So before we move to the next part of your story, I mean, what were some of the biggest takeaways from that first part of your journey? Uh, which part about owning a business? Uh huh. <laughs> um, what wow. what advice would you give to someone who's they're like they're in your shoes, right? They're trying to do the exact same thing as yeah. you were. Yeah. Well, I would say at the time that probably my. Um, how do you say this word? I always mess it up. Naivety, naivety. Ah, uh, naivete. Yeah, that was um, my biggest strength and also my biggest weakness. You know, I mean, just just like let's just start a company. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we literally just started it within a weekend and just threw up this website. So I would say that that helped us um, without knowing yeah. kind of what was in front of us. So that yeah. was helpful, um, but it was also really scary. I mean, we didn't know anyone in this in this place. Um, I would say that my biggest key takeaway from that experience was to just start, just mm. go, 
know, just, just start. And also, you know, using some lean methodologies, you know, figure out who those early adopters are, figure out like what your MVP is. Like, don't try to slay the dragon all at once. Just start with your basic offering and really do that really well. And, you know, get some validated learning tactics under your belt. That would probably be the biggest key takeaway that I would suggest. Nice. Validated learning. Well, we'll talk about that in a bit. So let's hear the next part of your journey. So that was, that was the first company. Yes. Why did you decide now I want to make another company? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we decided we wanted to have a family. So we had oh. a for about four and a half, you know, going on five years and it was really great. And we were at that point where we actually needed to either shut, shut down the agency or kind of make that, you know, make that journey across the chasm, <laughs> the, the, the valley of death and startup land. Mm. We definitely had to jump across the valley of death and we just didn't have the infrastructure in place to do that. So we, you know, failed in that respect. Um, but we decided to fold the agency. My husband ended up doing some work for, continued to work for Stanford and some other clients. And then I went on this journey to become a mom. Um, which was life changing, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of brings us to where we are today. Literally on my maternity leave, I got asked from one of my former clients of a large global organization. She was like, she called me in a panic. She was like, I just took this job at this nonprofit. We're 31 years old. Our brand is totally irrelevant, but our actual com- our organization is really impactful for entrepreneurship around the world. You know, could you come? Could you come in and help us? Um, and so I was like, sure, let me work from home, pay me the salary. I have this new baby, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here are all my demands. And, and she was like, sure. And then I said, okay. So <laughs> yeah. So I ended up working for this nonprofit, which I still consult with to this day. I love them. They're just an amazing nonprofit. And I got to see entrepreneurship on a global scale. Mm. We did work with the UN, we did work with the US Department of State, where we would take entrepreneurs from different countries and land them, do like a soft landing program to let them learn how to uh, grow their business in the US. Amazing. Yeah, it was really, really cool. So I got to see entrepreneurship on that level. Um, And then from there, my time at that organization was just kind of coming to an end. And my daughter was getting a little bit older. And I just really wanted to have the complete freedom to be my own boss again. And they really- be present and be active in, in my daughter's life the way that I wanted. Um, it really was for selfish reasons, <laughs> actually. <Yeah. laughs> but I mean, that's the truth, you know? Um, I really felt that our society and is our society is not really set up for working parents, much less working moms. Mm. I set out to change that. So I started So House, which was basically taking all the learnings that I've had from first agency to all the work that I've worked with and then developing a marketing framework that I can actually do with larger clients. Um, So that's where we are now. Huh, okay. Yeah. And um, so I'm I'm eager to start to dig into your experiences with like brand and rebranding and brand reparation, (laughs) which it sounds like you've done some of, as it relates to Lean Startup. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, I, I just, I, I participated in one major rebrand effort in, in my career. Um, at least it's this one stands up so far beyond all the other ones. I guess technically I've, I've been in a couple others, but um, where we took a, a company by the name of Taxi Magic and rebranded to Curb. And I had only like minimal visibility since my role was in tech uh, and working with the tech organization. Um, but I know a lot of like research goes into that. The thing I struggle with um, is that often in Lean Startup, when we're running experiments and we're gathering data, we really want to see um, some sort of desired behavior that tells us someone will actually do something or respond a certain way, rather than what someone says they will do. Which, like, look, like, you know, we make New Year's resolutions, and they're nice, but they're things we say we're going to do, but don't actually do, right? The same is true of thoughts about brands or products or services. So how do you actually learn? how someone really feels about a brand and, and how, I mean, you tell me, like a, a rebrand might actually influence a purchase decision. Mm-hmm. Wow, such a load of questions. Yes, that was, that was like a million questions. Like, Let me brain dump every question I have about rebranding and lean startup all in one. Basically, you can take this wherever you'd like. <laughs> I'll pick them apart one by one. Okay. I will say, I will say this, that in my experience, um, oftentimes people don't actually know why they're rebranding. 
they think that mm. sales are stagnant or something's not going on with the company or it's not progressing or growing the way that they should. And they automatically assume that a rebrand will fix all of it. Um, Can I applause? Can I just like, yeah. yes. Yes, rebrand is not the solution probably. I mean, I don't know. I just, no. like, I'm so skeptical. It's not always the solution. And I would say that that's the number one thing that with the clients that I've worked with and even the starter founders I've worked with is they're like, oh, we have to change everything and then everyone will get it. And it's like, no, okay, one, you need to really understand what is it about your company that's not growing and what kind of experiments can we run to validate or invalidate if the hypothesis is true. So I'll actually use the nonprofit that I work for as a really good example. Okay, cool. So when I came on board, you know, all their brand assets, just from a, you know, from a pure objective perspective, they were super stale. And what I did is I ran the executive team and the board of directors through this brand persona building exercise. And it's really easy. It's just like five questions, one of my favorite exercises I ever do. And basically what we do is we break down, if your brand were a person today, who would you be and why? Okay. Yeah. And so we go through this whole logic and they came up with two people. They came up with Hillary Clinton, pre-election, <laughs> yeah. Hillary Clinton and Walter Matthau from Garfield Men. Huh. Those right. the, yeah, those are the two personas that they came up with of who they were at that moment. And there's a lot of, you know, logic that went into that, but that was basically who they came up with. And so then we have a conversation of, okay, there's nothing wrong with those personas, but is that who you want the brand to be? And why do you want the brand to be something else? So then we did, the, we did the exercise again from an aspirational point of view. Same questions, but then who do you aspire to be? And they aspire to be a combination of Ellen DeGeneres and Jimmy Fallon. Okay. I know to a lot of people, this probably sounds like very abstract and very weird, but it's actually quite helpful because what it does is it gives you a roadmap of where you are today as a brand versus where you want to be. And then what does that mean? Like that's 180 degree opposite difference to be, you know, Walter Matthau from Grumpy Old Men to Jimmy Fallon. So if that's really who we as an organization claim that we want to be, and we are sort of like, we're like relentless in that vision, what steps do we need to take to incrementally shift the brand to that direction? So in their case, it was a rebrand. They had 30 years worth of experience and there was a ton of voices in the room and they really felt that their organization was critical for a rebrand. But that's not always the case. It doesn't always have to be that extreme. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, and I'd be kind of eager to hear like quantitatively, like what, how do you decide like, not just like where this personality wanted to be that personality, but like what, what changes from point A to point B to say, yeah. aha, this rebrand was actually successful. Yes, yes. Well, what we did prior to that is their organization has members. So of course we sent out member surveys. We had our engagement director go out there and talk to members, longtime members. You know, um, I would have loved to engage in a lot more experimentation than we did, but such as life, we had a very small window and we had to make I mean, honestly, like most organizations don't appreciate the true, the true power of experimentation, right? Yeah. Like, uh, because of, Gosh, if, if in a couple of days I could figure out the whole project wasn't worth doing, wasn't that worth whatever it cost yes. in terms of timeline toward delivery, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, seems really valuable to me. Yeah. Anyways. No, I know, absolutely. And something that I told them and that I tell all my clients that I work with is, look, it is not your job to have, or it is not the customer's job to tell you that you should, for in this case, rebrand or not. Oh, yeah, no. It's the job. Your job is to ask the customer the right questions in order for them, for you to get the feedback that you need to decide whether or not a, re a rebrand in this case is useful. And so based, off of, yeah, so based off of doing that, that's how they decided that their major rebrand was useful. They really felt that it was absolutely necessary. They felt that their organization needed to kind of be catapulted into this new era of innovation. And also you have to remember, um, their customers are within the realm of entrepreneurship. So the way that their brand looked before, it was super stale. It was super academic. It was, you know, these are, these are their words, not mine. We yeah. ended up calling it seasoned. It was just totally not resonating with their customer at all. So that was another reason why they really decided that they needed to just reshift the perception of this brand. And as a result, I advised them and I said, look, there may be some of the older members who do resonate with the brand. They may, they may not like this new Ellen Fallon hashtag that we made up. They may yeah. not, right? But the result of that is 
you could essentially acquire a new type of customer that you have not been able to acquire with your former brand. And that's what ended up happening. We did see some drop off and kind of some older clients who stayed. And then we got a 200% increase in brand new members after one year of our rebrand. These are new members that they've never spoken to before that we cultivated through this new brand experience. And that was just one of the, one of the many wins that we got from that. Wow. So now here's the million dollar question. Yes. How do you know the changes you made are the thing that resulted in the lift? Yeah. 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 Um, Like, look, like, so, so I'll give the example again. When I was a taxi magic, um, literally if it rained the the patterns would change profoundly right if there's a holiday time of year time of day uh, day of the week there's a million things that could influence ridership on any one day so is the patch that we just put live like having an influence or is it raining yeah yeah sure sure yeah well in our case we did a combination of things it was really a marketing communications Mm -hmm. Overhaul. So the, the so the rebrand was really just the first step into that process. We created a super comprehensive social media strategy. We understood like where our members are, what they expect from us, what they want from us. We did a ton of surveys and interviewing members. Like if you could get content from us, what would it be? What would be helpful to you? And then mm. after listening to what they actually said, we actually created solutions and things that they wanted. So one of the biggest things, for example, that they had a problem with was none of the, none of the members were engaging with the brands, with the nonprofit that I was working for. And the nonprofit, they do awards. I mean, it's a great platform for them. And mm. so it was, okay, we clearly as a brand are not doing something right because our members want to engage with us. They do it with other brands that are just like us. So we, we clearly are failing here. So what we did is we um, actually, we decided to use our social content as not as a sales tool, but as a way to really generate this buzz around the entrepreneurial community within our membership. So Mm. we would have members share case studies from other members. We would invite them to participate in webinars and webcasts just like this. We would make them feel loved and appreciated so that the only time they don't hear from us is when we're trying to get them to renew their membership. We had several touch points with this new brand up to membership and then that's how we could see that 200 increase was the cool. reason why have all those touch points so it sounds like there are a lot of things that you could point to but it would be hard to truly isolate like this change to the brand is the thing and, and like this is very hard to do which is why i was sort of curious to hear like how would you approach it and yeah. you know in in the world of a b testing where you test two things at the same time and you see which performs better and you mm-hmm. test them at the same time to keep all other variables equal um, in a perfect world, you only change one small thing yes. from the two versions. And you can say this one thing is what made the difference. But in this case, it sounds a little bit like what's called a kitchen sink test. Yeah. It's called that because you throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. Um, right. And you, you change a bunch of stuff. And the reason you do that is because it's just totally impractical to try to measure the, the one thing. I think it would be interesting to sort of sit down and try to craft like the specific measurements to get exactly this to exactly that. But I also get that like, look, often the, the leaders don't necessarily care as much about knowing exactly what made what change as, yeah. like, I'd like them to. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's really more about, like, what are our membership numbers and is the, or, you know, the organization was on, a, was on a significant downfall. So now it's like, not only did we stabilize, but then we increased, you know, in this new market segment that we, that we hadn't had before. Amazing. Um, and, but, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, that would be... The, the, the data person in me would love to be able to pinpoint every single yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a business of innovation accounting, and it's like one of the most advanced lean startup principles simply because it is so hard to actually get the actionable metric. The actionable metric being like, we made this change, and we quantitatively can demonstrate that changes in this result directly in changes to that, where that is the set of things we actually want as an outcome. So... I, I, yeah, I totally get that. Now, you said something interesting that I thought was really fascinating that resonates with my experience, which was around understanding from customers kind of what problems they were having rather than what solutions they maybe wanted. Um, because in my experience, people are really good at telling you what problems they have, but really not so great uh, at telling you what solutions they need, yes. right? Like, look, look no further than Henry Ford. If I had <laughs> asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the framework that I take my clients through, phase two of the framework is branding. So people think like, we're going to jump right into branding. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, customers. 
So I, <laughs> I make them go through this like pretty regimented parkour process of like, let's validate our customers. Let's understand our customers. What are their problems before you go into solution space? Because you can do that all day long. Mm -hmm. Understand what the problems our customers are having. And then let's select which ones have the most value to them and then solve those problems. Amen. Solve those problems really well. And then you can worry about other problems. Yeah. You know, I learned this terminology from my colleague, Dan Olson, who um, really explains this exceptionally well, which is the difference between the problem space and the solution space. Yes. Right? Problem space is the world of problems that we might need or want to go solve. The solution space is the world of possible solutions that can go and solve them. And I find that we are often in a state of crisis where... <laughs> Like people are so focused on solutions. They don't understand they're not solving a problem. They're just implementing the solution concept. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And so, yeah. Tell, tell us about this process you have because like, look, I, I'm a total noob when it comes to brand and marketing and all that stuff. So, so what is this process? What is it aiming to solve and, and how does it work? Yes. Yeah. So really what it is, is we'll go back to kind of my founder story. So when I developed So House, I was like, all right, there's a million and billion marketing and brand strategists out there, right? Like, what's my differentiator, right? What's my MVP? What is it that I do? Like, I know I'm good at what I do, but no one else knows that I'm good at what right. I do. So, and how do they, how do, how do they, how do I create value from that? So really what it was, I think my husband was like out of town and my daughter was in school and I was like, had, all, had my music blaring and, and I just had this like beautiful mind moment where I was like, all right, like, let me just really think back to all the projects that I've been able to work on from large entities to tiny little startups. What are the common, what are the, what are the common denominators between those things? And I just like, I just like brain vomited all out there. Mm. And I started to see that when it comes to building a brand and building a marketing infrastructure, the, the steps it takes to do that are actually kind of always the same. doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit, doesn't matter if you're a startup, doesn't matter if you're a giant corporation to its, to its core, it's kind of the same process. So that, that was my big hypothesis. So I went out to validate the hypothesis and that kind of where I created the bones of the Sohouse framework. And what it is, is it pulls down all the, all of these, four common denominators that I've learned over the years. And then it combines a ton of lean startup concepts like validated learning, the build micro learn feedback loop, innovation accounting, all these things. And it also pulls in some other tools that I really like to use, like the business model canvas, which I'm sure you're super familiar with. Mm. Proposition design canvas is a bunch of other tools. And what I, what I thought was, I've seen all these tools work individually, but I haven't really seen them work together within a marketing infrastructure seamlessly so yeah. everyone knows that link startup is good everyone knows that value proposition canvas is great everyone knows that brand personas are good for example but how do you how do you create a system of these things and what's the connection between all of them sure. so that's, that's what i set out to understand and so i built this you know the beta basically of this framework and so i went back to some of my former clients and i was like hey for free will you be my guinea pig and will you let me test this process out on you mm, and let's good see strategy are. let's just figure it out and so they were like yeah awesome let's do it so I tested it with four or five different clients and good partners and I ended up tweaking little things along the way but you know one was a nonprofit, one was a global organization one was a tiny little startup founder so I tested it in different you know market segments and different verticals and the results were awesome you know it was just like I don't want to call it strategy by numbers because it's not that easy. You really need someone to take you through the concepts to understand it well, mm -hmm. but the foundation is there. And I call it an open source framework for a reason because none of it is proprietary to what I do. These are all concepts that already exist on their own. I've just put them together in a system that can be followed, right? So like a lot of people know that you're supposed to use certain lean startup concepts, but they don't know what order to use them in or when you should use them. And that's what the framework um, advises you on. Cool. Yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of people who uh, are new to Lean Startup and don't know those things, right? So, yeah, I, I get it. And, it, you know, it's interesting. I personally have sort of strung together my own sort of set of tools. And every Lean Startup practitioner I know kind of takes the ones they like and puts them together, right? And, you know, each one solves a different problem. And it sounds like you've got a set of things that works really well in a marketing context, which is 
kind of excellent. Yeah, marketing. Then, marketing what, what I want to dig into a little bit is like, okay, so what, what it sounds like you did, it, it sounds a little bit to me like what's called a concierge style minimum viable product where you're doing something very, very manually, heavily interacting with your customers, perhaps more than you normally would in order to understand how it works, why it works, um, and you are, you're delivering that service. Do you have any intention or vision for scaling that up? And, and, or did you learn anything that you know, would help you get to a place where you're going to automate things? Or are you more in the direction of getting directional feedback to try to refine what it is that you're doing? Yeah. So this past year, well, year and a half, was all about directional feedback. How do mm -hmm. I really make sure that this is sticky? How do I really make sure that this is helpful? Now, this question of automation and scale. Remember, I'm a, I'm a mother of a young right. I don't have time. And also, my, my time and capacity is limited. I can only take on so many consulting clients. And at the end of the day, while I love consulting work and I love working with like large innovation teams and like really cool projects, my heart are entrepreneurs and startup founders. Like that's where my heart just like, <laughs> um, particularly female business owners, right? That's a big part of my personal brand and my love. So my second part of the business, which is what I'm launching in 2019, was okay, now that I know that this, that this framework is useful and I know that it's helpful, how do I get it out to more people? Particularly, how do I get it out to startup founders? Because that's the audience that I want to serve. Um, and so I set out to kind of test that and I never knew this, but online courses are like all the rage. Had no idea. You would have asked me this a year ago. I never, ever would have thought that I would be creating an online course, but long story, very short. I ended up teaching a workshop in Chicago for um, a client in front of mine. Yeah. As part of that sort of uh, trade-off, um, she let me do an email blast, like, you know, book your 30 minute consultancy with this, you know, brand strategist, whatever. And that was just sort of a, just a test testing ground to see if people were interested in brand strategy, particularly in startup founders. Mm. My calendar was full, like absolutely full. And so through that process, I realized I started taking notes of the questions they were asking me. And I realized that they were all kind of the same questions, all the same stuff. Like, how do you build a brand? What does that even mean to build a brand? How yeah. do you know marketing right? What tools do you need? Do you do social media first? And if so, what platforms would you be on? I mean, all these questions. So I started notating all these questions and, um, and understanding that they were the, the audience that I was going after and they were asking me the same questions. I was like, okay, my hypothesis is what if I could take the framework, the core modules that address all these pain points that these startup founders are asking me? And what if I could pare down my in-person workshops that I already do and turn it into an online course? Yep. Oops, like this big, this big hypothesis. Okay. So then I set out to test, to test and validate that. So yes, I, I'm eager for the details of how you test these things. Okay. I got it. Okay. Instagram is my platform. It's been my platform. It's the one platform that I'm investing time and energy on. And so, and I know that my audience, startup founders, particularly moms and, you know, women, female business owners, I know that they're on Instagram. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. How, how do you know that? There is like a I just... huge, yeah, well, you can do a bunch of hashtag research. I mean, there is a huge, mm. huge ecosystem of like women's empowerment and like female founders that are on, they're on Pinterest and other areas as well, but they're on Instagram. So that was one of the reasons, that was one way that I knew that they were on there. And so what I did is I was like, all right, I logged into Canva, free, free resource, and I created yeah. an Instagram. And I developed a landing page where it had all this information, like here's what you can get from the course, here's what, here's what, you're, here's what you'll learn. And a lot of it I had pulled from my in-person workshop, so I knew it was relevant, but I hadn't created any of the course content. I didn't even have a platform to put it on. Okay. And so I offered, I did a limited six weeks promotion. Um, well, I only promoted for one week. Let me clarify that. I had, I had it open for six weeks, but I promoted it um, on Instagram for one week. I spent $98 and I got over a hundred people to sign up to a free beta program. All right. Yeah. And so I was like, oh my God. So my number was 25. Okay. If I could get 25 people that show interest in this course, then I will reinvest the money that I, you know, make with my consulting clients into building this new digital product that I have no nice. idea. 
So, so I love that you had an objective in advance of running the experiment, because this yeah. is something that so many lean startup practitioners do incorrectly, and they say they're generating validated learning, which is not true. So in order to have validated learning, you need to be doing the scientific methodology. To do that, you need to have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is not just, I believe, whatever, but it's actually a statement that can be proven true or false quantitatively. Yes. Right. And so the big question I often am working with folks around is what becomes that quantitative value? What do you put there that makes sense? And I love that you had that in advance of running your experiment. You know, the way that I have often seen folks use something like that, if you have something like a rough financial model, is to say, here's what my cost to acquire customers has to ultimately be less than. And I can be way off. I can, right. Like for now, it might even be way higher than that. But if I can't do better than this giant number, I have a huge problem. That's so right. I love that you uh, set a, a value there. Nice. Yeah, I did. I mean, I'm like, forget it. There's no, there is no way I'm going to set out and create this course if I'm not damn sure <laughs> that Preach. at least someone wants to buy Amen. it. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I had over 100 people sign up for this beta program. And then I was like, oh my God, now I have to create a course. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. That's, that's what we call a high quality problem. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that's what I did. I created the course and it's amazing and I love it. And I'll be launching, well, I'm almost finished with beta right now and I'll be launching the paid version probably around February or so. Did you months. do uh, further tests around how well it scales? Like you got a hundred people, but have you tried to recruit more? Oh, not yet. No, not yet. Not okay. yet. All so, right. Like content creation mode right now, but that's my next step. Yeah, so my next yeah I mean, like, look, like, all right, you got pretty good results with a hundred bucks. I mean, can, like, I wonder how much it scales. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and also too, you know, a lot of the content that I'm doing in the course, it's all this, it's all the content that I do in person. But the problem is I'm not an instructional designer. So I don't, I don't really know the science behind creating content for an online learning environment. That's going to be different than your in-person workshops. So mm. that's the big thing that I'm looking to test with the data is I want to know where do people fall? Where are they getting confused? Like, where am I losing them? Because the way that the course is designed, the modules build on top of each other. So if you're lost in module one, you're going to be so far lost by module 10. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm set out to, to figure out is where are they dropping? Where do they have questions? Um, so yeah, so that's the bottom of the course. All right. Is, this is very interesting because so the test you did got people to sign up for a beta, but there's no financial commitment. No. Is there a financial commitment to your course? Yes, there okay. is. See that, this is where the rubber meets the road. Yes. <laughs> is yeah. like, will they actually pay? Now they signed up for a beta, this is very good, right? This is, so, you know, on a scale of feedback, right? And the, and the value of that feedback, the word I have used for this in the past is currency, right? Mm -hmm. Actual money is the king of currency. Oh yeah. Um, people saying they will do something and, and actually meaning they will do it, right? You give me the money, that's like a big deal. Um, yeah. but the lower end is someone saying, oh yeah, I, I would totally use that. Right. And, and somewhere more toward the middle is that realm of, um, sign me up. Here is some of my personal information. What personal information did you collect? Email? Yes. So I just collected first and last name. That's it. First and last name and email. Yep. That's it. I'm oh, sorry. An email. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So first cool. and last name. Email. Yeah. Very, right. very super easy. I made the landing page really seamless. I made the sign up process really easy. Nice. And it's a fun story. I, on my landing page, I had a 71% conversion rate. Whoa. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so that's, um, that's but bananas. That, but that's for the free version, right? So I totally expect that once the paid version comes out, it's going to, it's going to plummet. Yeah. It's never. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, you'll have some interesting questions around like, how do you price it and all that kind of stuff? Cause online courses are, I mean, it's very fascinating. So, you know, let me ask this question. You have all these email addresses. Do you end up interviewing any of these customers? I will do so. Uh huh. Uh -huh. There it is. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd see what they, <laughs> why they signed up. Learn. In order for them to, so right now they're in beta, right? In order for them to finish beta, they actually are required. And I set this expectation before. So like, hey, yes, you get this content for free. And I'm like legitimately going to help you with your business because this is going to be super useful for you. Um, and as a result, sort of your currency back to me is that you're going to answer these questions along the way. You're going to be able to do blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? So I'm cool. getting feedback, specific feedback along the way. Love it. Cool. Well, you know, I really enjoyed chatting about all this stuff. Is there any other topic that you want to cover today? Um, 
I mean, brand strategy is so vast, you know? So maybe we could go over, so you know your audience best. So what do you think would be like maybe two or three key takeaways that your audience would find most valuable that we could cover in this chat? Most valuable that we've not covered yet? Um, intersection of lean startup and brand strategy. Let's, like, let's go there. And I know you mentioned a bunch of tools. Yes. Um, you mentioned a, that you've got a process, which makes sense to me. But if there's any other uh, wisdom that you've got there, I'm sure the audience will appreciate it. Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing that we talked about, which was sometimes branding isn't the solution. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. This. Work, go in that direction. Just, yeah. Keep Push on that. that. Yeah, yeah. And I, this is stuff that you guys preach already with Lean Startup. But I mean, yeah, for the startup founders that are listening, the question that I get asked the most is like, how do you actually build a brand around this idea? Mm -hmm. you know? And it just really starts with something very self-explanatory, which is like really understanding your customers. Like, I know that's just like preaching to the choir, but I mean, I can't, I can't make it any more simpler than that. Like if you, if you do not fully understand the pain point that you are solving with your product or service, your brand that you create is going to be noise. It's just going to be fluff and it's not, not going to have any substance. So that would be the one thing that I would advise is like really kind of get your mind in that framework of being sort of this like scientist, like remove, try to remove your emotions off of who you are as a startup founder. One of the things I teach in my course is that uh, failure is required, right? Which is a lean startup principle. And oftentimes I find that startup founders and teams, they associate that they are failures at people if one of their experiments. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case. Like that is not the case. Of course I wanted 25 people to sign up for my beta, but if they didn't, that doesn't mean that I'm a failed founder. It means that something in my experiment is wrong or my hypothesis is off or there's something going on with what, you know, with, with that process. So that would be a big thing that I would advise. Yeah. I mean, I'm smiling. Cause like, you know, look, this concept of like what, what really is a failure is an interesting yeah. one. And I would argue building something that nobody uses is the real direction in which I might define failure, even though I don't like using that word at all. And I know a number of folks who say like, yeah, we just don't use the word right to avoid the cultural and organizational impl implications of, of, of that. Like just yeah. gone. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's important to fail fast. I think it's so important, you know, to do these experiments to really like test and validate these things. Yeah. Where fail fast actually means learn fast, right? Yeah. That's really what we're hunting for. Fail fast, fun phrase to say, but we really mean like learn rapidly so that we can start doing what actually works. The point's not to fail. The point is to learn. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Well, I have really enjoyed this conversation and, you know, a, a couple of major takeaways that I will leave with the audience and uh, I want to hear some of yours as well, um, is that you can and should be applying Lean Startup to your brand work and specifically the most important thing, which is true of so many things, is know the real problem that you're solving. Because if you know what problem you need to solve, you can solve it in a way that actually makes sense. And that might be brand and that might not be. Yeah. I'm awesome. Gonna... How can folks get in touch with you if they'd like more information? Yeah, yeah. So let's see. As I mentioned before, I'm on Instagram. So hit me up on Instagram. It's at my name, Jessica underscore Courthouse. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, but I'm not, you know, you like... I'm just on LinkedIn to be on LinkedIn, but if you really want to like get real with me, Instagram is the place to be. And then of course, uh, people can just go onto the website, so also.com, reach out to me, and that's it. Nice. You know, it's funny you say Instagram is the way to reach you. I have a family member who is only reachable through Instagram. Don't text. Don't call. Just yeah. Instagram is the it's only way. Amazing. It's amazing. That platform is totally revolutionary. Revolutionary. Huh. People communicate is unbelievable. Awesome. All right. Well. Again, my friends, my name is Elliot Tussel. I really enjoyed this chat with you. If you've got any questions, uh, leave it in the comments of this video, or you also can send an email, and we'll make sure that information is included in the description of the video. I believe it's education at leanstartup.co. I really enjoyed doing this conversation with you, Jessica. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Awesome. All right, my friends. Well, until next time, you take care. Bye.